Well, in 879 BC, King Asser Nazar Paul II, there's a great name that you never hear anymore. Maybe you're going to have a kid, Asser Nazar Paul, there you go, uh, the second of Assyria. Here's a picture of him in stone, by the way. He completed building not only a new palace, but an entire new city. It's the city of Nimrud, and here it is. And as you can see, it was just lavish, beautiful, luxurious place. Now, Azar Nazar Paul celebrated the, the opening of his new palace and the inauguration of this new city by hosting maybe the greatest, most generous, and lavish party ever. He invited the entire country of Assyria to join him, and 70,000 people came. For 10 days, they feasted. And according to Assyrian records, partygoers consumed 15,000 sheep, 2,500 oxen, cattle, and gazelles, 10,000 fish, 10,000 eggs, 10,000 loaves of bread, hundreds of tubs of fruits and vegetables and cheese and nuts and honey and spices. And to wash it down, those 70,000 guests consumed 20,000 jugs of beer and wine. <laughs> wow, that was some party, right? Now, how in the world could Asser Nazar Paul be so generous? Well, here's the thing. He was the ruler of the known world, and his wealth was nearly unlimited. Would have been so interesting to be at that party, don't you think? Well, we're in a series called Foundations. It's about developing foundational habits that will help us flourish, both as followers of Jesus and as a church. And last week's habit was think biblically about your stuff. Think biblically about your stuff. This week is a continuation of that habit, which goes like this. Be generous with your stuff. All right, so first of all, think biblically. And by the way, if you missed it, go back and watch that one first, all right? Think biblically about your stuff. And then as you're thinking biblically about it, then be generous with your stuff. One of the values that we have in writing at the Crossing Church is this one, cheerful generosity. This is both who we are and who we want to become more of. And this is what it says. God is a lavish giver. We follow him by giving freely of our resources toward the mission he has given us. One of our goals, the thing we want to be true about us as at the DNA level is that we have cheerful generosity that pervades us personally and pervades us as a church. Now this value, it comes right out of Scripture. And so I want to take a tour this morning of what Scripture says about cheerful generosity. Let's dive in. I want to start with my favorite passage. This is Ephesians 1 verses 3 through 8. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Even before He made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in His eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into His own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave us our sins. He has showered his kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. Here's the first thing that we find out about generosity in Scripture it goes like this. Generosity is God's nature, all right? God's go-to, God's default mode is to be generous. God is the most lavish, generous giver in the universe. You know, so often people picture God as tight fisty and crabby, kind of like the, the picture that I found online. Like This is the picture of who God is. He's kind of angry and he's tight-fisted and, and stingy. When I was 13 years old, I had, I had a paper out, and after school, we would all bike to Mrs. W's house, and we had a nickname for her. It had to do with a black pointy hat. <laughs> and honestly, 
Mrs. W didn't do much to dispel that reputation. She was crabby if you were late or if you missed a house or if you didn't collect the payment on time, she would ream you up and down right in front of all the other paper boys. And sometimes it was deserved, but the problem is there was nothing on the other side of the ledger. There was no encouragement, just a glowering stare if you messed up. And, and that's how sometimes people see God. But Scripture tells us that is so not who He is. Listen to James 1.17. It says, whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father, who created all the lights in the heavens. And I've said this before, but it's so important for us to remember that every good thing you've ever experienced is a gift from God, given not begrudgingly, but given with great joy. God loves to go, here, have this. The, the, the beauty that surrounds us, the people you love, the friendships you, you treasure, the house you live in, the, the job you have, the car you drive, those deep and intense moments of peace and contentment and wonder, the times you laugh so hard, you cry, those are all gifts we would not have and we could not experience without the presence and the power of Christ in us and around us. We have no idea how actively God is upholding the good things in the world around us. Here's another passage. This is from Jesus, Matthew 5, verse, starting in verse 43. Jesus says, Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you'll be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. For He gives His sunlight to both the evil and the good, and He sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. In other words, God's generosity is not limited by our action. God's generosity is not limited by our ability to love Him or know Him or follow Him. Jesus says God is generous no matter who you are. God is generous even to those who resist Him, who are evil, who reject Him. Being generous is just who God is. It's what He does. It's how He rolls. Now, of course, God's ultimate act of generosity was when He took, our, took on skin and bones and He entered our world in the person of Jesus. And He allowed Himself to be nailed to a cross and humiliated and ridiculed and spit upon. And then He died all so that we could experience His life flowing to us and His forgiveness washing over us and, and His healing growing in us and His freedom spreading through us. Folks, that is profound generosity. God's default is to be generous. He is generous through and through. Here's the way Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9. He says, You know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, so that by His poverty He could make you rich. So, why be generous? Well, first of all, be generous because God is generous. The one who knows us best and loves us most, His heart toward us is generous. He is the source of everything we have. God is generous. Here's the second reason that we ought to be generous. Generosity is the hallmark of the church. All right, it's what it means for us together to be followers of Jesus. Now look at what happens here in Acts chapter 2, verse, starting in verse 43. It's talking about the early church, the very first church. A deep sense of awe came over them all. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. Now, over and over in Scripture, we find that exact scenario played out. Acts chapter 11 talks about a famine that was in Jerusalem and the response of the church in Antioch, Syria. Uh, Acts 11 verse 29. So, the believers in Antioch decided to send relief to the brothers and sisters in Jerusalem, everyone giving as much as they could. There's this sense that, that we're all in this thing together and we exist for something bigger than ourselves. And so we give 
every chance we get, we give in every way we can as generously as we're able to. Acts chapter 4 tells us that, that, that they were so generous with each other that there were no needy people among them. Can you imagine that? They were so generous that if you were part of the early church in Acts, there were, you, there were no needy people among them. Everyone had their needs met because when there was a need, someone would sell a piece of property. Someone would sell their car or their version of a car, and they would bring their money to the church to, to be distributed. That's radical. You know, I'm, I'm trying to think if, if I have ever sold something to help another person in need because this is a crazy kind of commitment, but it was because of this very attitude, this, this generosity that permeated the early church. It's because of this that Christianity had spread like wildfire. I mean, think about it. It makes sense. The radical, uncommon generosity that was seen in this early church was visible proof of the power of Jesus and of His resurrection. I mean, how else can you explain something like that. And who wouldn't want to be part of a community like that? And that's exactly what happened. Acts chapter 2, verse 46 says, they shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. It was so attractive, this, this generous posture of those early followers of Jesus, and it spoke to the reality of the transformation that comes through Jesus. It wasn't perfect. As you continue to read the story of the early church, you see that they were just as dysfunctional and broken as we are today. But it underscores the fact that we are to be a generous people. We are to strive for generosity together as a church. One of the ways we do that is we support a family in the Middle East that works specifically with Muslims to explore what it means to follow Jesus. They, they help Christ followers grow in their faith, and they assist Syrian refugees with food and clothing and education. One of my favorite projects that we helped them with was when they started a blanket factory, and they hired refugees to sew the blankets. And so refugees were making money by making blankets, and then the blankets were given to other refugees. It's so cool. And listen, folks, because of your generosity, because of our generosity, we got to and we get to be part of what God is doing all over the world. It's so cool and it's so fun and it feels so right. And we aspire to increase our generosity as a church. By God's grace, as each of us learns to grow as generous people, we will become generous as a church in whole new ways that we haven't even dreamed of yet. All right, here's a third thing about generosity. Generosity is a characteristic of spiritual maturity. Generosity is a characteristic of spiritual maturity. Throughout Scripture, we find that generosity accompanies spiritual maturity. Psalm 112, verse 4, light shines in the darkness for the godly. They are generous, compassionate, and righteous. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 7, the Apostle Paul says, since you excel in so many ways in your faith, your gifted speakers, your knowledge, your enthusiasm, and your love for us, I want you to excel also in this gracious act of giving. I notice something here that, that I find interesting. Just as important as loving others and knowing God, Paul says, is learning how to give, learning to be generous, learning to excel and grow at being generous. The key word there is learning because there is a learning curve. <laughs> we have to learn how to be generous because it's not natural to us. We have to push against the desire to, to hold on to our stuff like we talked about last week. There's an old legend that, that may have some roots in truth, we don't know for sure, but it goes like this. In an, in an attempt to recapture Jerusalem in the 12th century, the Crusaders hired mercenaries to fight for them. And because it was a religious war, the Crusaders insisted that the mercenaries be baptized 
before they fought. Okay, that's wrong on a whole lot of levels. But anyway, so as they were baptized, the story goes, the mercenaries held their swords out of the water to symbolize the one thing over which they retained control. It's like, God, you can have every part of me except for this part, my sword. I'm going to do whatever I please with that. And unfortunately, that's kind of the way it tends to work for a lot of us with our bank accounts. It's like, Lord, my life is yours, except for this part, except for the financial aspect of my life. Now, the problem with that, according to Jesus, is that how I view my money has a direct impact on my spiritual life. Here's how he puts it in Luke 16. He says, no one can serve two masters. For you hate one and love the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The way I see, the way I use my finances will either strangle my relationship with God or stimulate it to grow and flourish. Our wealth, our possessions, our stuff, like we talked about Last week, they all have this incredibly strong gravitational pull on our souls. And if we're not careful, they will take over. My money is the primary competition that God has for my heart. And the funny thing is, like we talked about last week, it's not mine anyway. <laughs> I'm not the owner. I'm just the manager. I have it for a short time and then it goes to someone else to manage. 250 years after Azar Nazarpal, the guy who threw the party for 70,000 Assyrians, 250 years after him, the Babylonians attacked and demolished Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, and the empire vanished. And on the day that that happened, that the Babylonians sacked Nineveh, the current king, he gathered all his gold and his jewels, and he made a huge pile in a room. He sat on top of it and killed himself. Question, what happened to all that gold that he accumulated? Did it go with him? Of course not. This once great Assyrian king, the master of the known world, did not take one ounce, one speck of gold dust with him. He left it all behind in a pile on the floor. The Babylonians took it. And then from then, the Persians took it. And from them, Alexander the Great took it. And from him, the Romans took it took it. And from then, the barbarians took it. Then I have no idea who took it after that. And all I know is that nobody kept it. The truth is, folks, in 50 years, you'll probably be dead. <laughs> or if you're really young and watching this, maybe you have 75 years. I don't know. And God has given us resources to use while we are here, while we're still breathing, to meet our needs and also to build His kingdom, to send it on ahead, so to speak. And the more that we surrender to Christ, the more spiritually mature we become, the more we take on that long-term perspective and the more generous we are. It's like, you know what? I can't take this with me. And so I'm going to use it. Thank you, God. I'm going to use it to meet my needs. And I'm going to find ways to give it away. Find ways that you want me to use it. So how do we step toward generosity? How do we grow? Well, mostly you just start. <laughs> you, don't pray, you don't pray, God, give me more. And then, and then when you do, then I'll be generous. No, no, no. You, you start with what you have and then you grow it from there. So what does that look like? Well, I want to remind you, last week I talked about Andy Stanley's three Ps, and, and here they are again. If, if you want to become generous, it's pretty simple. First of all, make it a priority in your budget, okay? So every time you get paid, give. Sherry and I have done this in a very practical way. We set up automatic withdrawal with the Crossing Church 
online because automation beats determination every day of the week. So if you want to be generous, make it a priority, a real one in your budget. Secondly, pick a percentage. Pick a percentage to actually give. Be intentional about it. The scripture says that 10% is a great place to start. And again, if that feels like too much, well then pick a different percentage, but do pick something that stretches you. Sherry and I have been giving at least 10% for years, and honestly, we don't even notice it anymore. It's just part of what we do. Here's the third one is progress and grow. As God blesses you, increase the percentage. And I'll be honest with you, when, when, when we have done this, I have been stretched, but you know what? I have also been blessed greatly because I am choosing to trust God in a greater way in my life. Now there's a fourth P that I did not mention last week, and it's this one, be a prompted giver. And what that means is as God makes you aware of needs and you want to meet them, do. <laughs> okay, from, from, from time to time, we, we become aware of needs and there's something in us that goes, meet that need. And so you step out and, and you do make, make it your habit to, to meet needs as, as God prompts you. Now we have a very real opportunity to do that today. As you well know, Hurricane Ian roared through Florida this week, wreaking havoc, especially in the Fort Myers area. Now I've been in contact with pastors that I know there, and they're still assessing the damages. But in the meantime, we've established a fund for hurricane relief, Hurricane Ian relief, and I want to invite you to give so that we can get it to the people on the ground. And we were partnering with an organization that will actually set up points of distribution, especially in the Fort Myers area where it was hit the worst, and then make sure that there's food and clothing and shelter and needs. And if there's a way we can bless churches that need to repair and, and rebuild, we will do that as well. And so there, here's a need right in front of us that just happened a few days ago. So if you want to do that, just go to thecrossingchurch.org. You can click the Give tab, and there'll be a drop-down menu that says Hurricane Relief. All right, so, so when God prompts you, don't ignore it. Follow the prompt. That's what generosity looks like. All right, so when you put all that together as we learn, as we practice, as we grow in the art of cheerful generosity, amazing things happen. God uses it and His kingdom flourishes. I want to close by telling you a story about a strand of generosity, a long strand of generosity that has made a difference in my life and whether you realize it or not, in yours. Starts way back in 1862 when this guy, John Alexis Egren, emigrated from Sweden to the United States. Now, God had given John Egren a dream to start a seminary to train pastors who were starting churches among Swedes in the upper Midwest, what was would become Minnesota and Wisconsin and Illinois and that whole area. Now, Egren had way more vision then he had funding, and so he asked other Swedes if they would support him financially. They did. And money was always tight, and sometimes they didn't know if the school would make it to the next month or not, but God always provided through the generosity of others who were unknown to us, people we don't know. The first student at Edgren Seminary was a guy named Christopher Celine. This is his picture here. Now, Celine lived in the Northwoods of Minnesota, and when he heard of Edgren's school, he really wanted to go, but he didn't earn enough money to pay for it. He couldn't afford to go to seminary. So a couple of the men he worked with were followers of Jesus, and when he told them that he, he felt God calling him to be a pastor, but he couldn't afford it, they said, hey, if you want to go to seminary, we will pay for it. And so, and so Christopher Celine, through the generosity of others, he went to seminary. After he graduated, Silene began traveling around northern Minnesota and Wisconsin, starting churches. And once again, it was because it was possible because of the generosity of others. One of the churches that he started was this one. It's no longer there. It's this old building, but it was Wood River Baptist Church, just outside of Grantsburg, Wisconsin. That's way northern Wisconsin. All right. Fast forward 
80 years, Wood River Church had merged with the first Swedish Baptist Church. Together they became Grace Baptist Church in Grantsburg, Wisconsin. My dad went to church there. He came to faith there. He was baptized there. In the early 1960s, Grace Baptist, along with a number of other churches in the region, they decided to start a church in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, and they generously provided funds to help pay a pastor. The name of the church was Salem Baptist. Here's a picture of it. This is the church that I grew up in. And it was there because of the generosity of some Swedes from the late 1800s. All right, so 15 or 20 more years passed. By that time, I had returned to Salem as their youth pastor, but while we were there, we felt God calling us to start a church. And Salem generously provided half of my salary. I also visited a bunch of those old Swedish churches in northern Wisconsin, like, like Grace, and I invited people to join our support team. I remember very vividly one quite elderly woman came up and she said, you know what, I don't have much but I want to be part of what God is doing, and she committed to giving us $10 a month, which was quite a stretch for her, I'm sure, but she was generous as God had given to her. Way back in 1993, Sherry and I launched Valleybrook Church in downtown Eau Claire, Wisconsin, and God worked in ways that we didn't expect. It grew rapidly. We started several daughter churches. In 2004, we were invited to move here to Orlando to start another church. And after a great deal of agonizing and praying, we said yes. And Valleybrook paid half my salary and a number of others generously committed to the rest. And on March 3rd, 2006, the Crossing Church was born. Here's a picture of our first Easter service. And in the years since that day, we have seen people become followers of Jesus. We've seen God transform lives. We've seen Him bring healing. Five years ago, we ourselves launched Hope Community Church in Wildwood. And within just a few months, we're going to have a new home here at the Grove. And I can see the day when we'll start more daughter churches, and then we'll have granddaughter churches, and hundreds of lives will be remade by the power of of Jesus. Now listen, all of the above happened because of the generosity of God's people, starting way back in the 1800s. And you can see at every step along the way, God provided the resources that were needed through the generosity of this people, and it had a huge impact on me, and it's had a huge impact on many of you as well. Do you want to be part of the stream and flow of what God is doing, not just now, but far beyond your lifetime? Do you want to be part of something that lasts on into eternity? Then be generous. Use what God has given you to help grow His kingdom and make Him famous to future generations. Let's pray. Father, you are generous. You're generous to us every day, every moment, and sometimes we notice. And we thank you that your default, your posture toward us is one of generosity and, and giving. And most of all, we thank you that you gave yourself in the person of Jesus who died on the cross and rose from the dead so that we could be remade and reconciled with you. God, we thank you for that act of kind generosity. Lord, we pray that you will give us your heart, that you will make us into people who are like you, that you will give us generous postures just as you have. And then, Father, by your grace, in your grace, let us be part of your work in the lives of others. Lord, use our generosity. Let your resources flow through us into the lives of others so that we can be part of the stream and flow of your work lasting not just our lifetimes, but into the lifetimes of our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. Father, thank you that you led us and you invite us to join you in your work. 
Would you teach us how to step into that in greater and greater ways? Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll talk to you next time.